Okay, welcome back. Let's get moving on the eye and the ear. So for my class, what we're going to do is a subset of the chapter 17 content. So not all of it. Um, it does cover the other special senses, but we're not going to focus on those. As interesting as they are, we just we only have two quarters for this stuff. We don't really have time for it. So if you have questions about gustation or olfaction, feel free to ask me. Um, they're both very interesting chemoreceptive senses uh, with a lot of nuance and coolness about them. It's just we don't have the time to go over all of them, so we kind of picked the most clinically relevant ones uh, because some of you might end up in ophthalmology or audiology, so it would be better if we could just focus on these, and so that that's what we've decided to do in our program. Uh, it sucks to have to make that choice, but it's a reality of a two-quarter a and P sequence, which is just not a lot of time, as you all know. Okay, so let's get started. Fortunately, uh, in my undergrad life, I did uh, sensory physiology for my focus of my undergraduate research, uh, specifically on mechanoreceptors, which is what the uh, ear is. So this is kind of my wheelhouse from that perspective. It's not what I did my graduate research on, but it still uh, is super interesting and I'm really amped about it and it's really fun to talk about. I also used to teach sensory physiology at Portland State University. So um, this is something that I have a lot of expertise about and have a lot of passion for because the way that we turn sensory information that's external into action potentials and then make sense of it is just super cool. So uh, I hope that comes through and makes it fun for you because it's fun for me. Okay, so let me just gonna go ahead and get my tablet situated so that I can draw. There we go. And oops. Let me just go ahead and drop my pen. All right. Sorry, I'm not meaning to make nose sounds. Uh, my bad. I apologize if that was gross. Okay, so we're going to start with eye. So obviously, the eyeball is, uh, you know, the sensory unit for vision. And it has many parts that all play an important role in vision. And we will discuss those. So, so from that perspective, even though I have a bias, I consider the gross anatomy of the eyeball to be perhaps the least interesting portion of the eyeball, really all about the retina. Uh, it is really still important to understand the gross anatomy of the eyeball in order to understand how it works. So with that in mind, let's talk about the tunics. And I want to pause here and discuss the word tunics. Uh, because tunics will come back. So there's also tunics of the digestive system. So what tunics means in, in anatomical terms is just when organs have more than one layer and those layers have different functions, we call those layers tunics. And we discuss the tunics on terms not only of their anatomy, but also of their physiology. So uh, they all have a particular role to play in whatever organ they are making up. And the same is true of the eyeball here. So that's kind of the rationale for that terminology. So we'll discuss the tunics and then we'll just talk about what they do. So the fibrous tunic, which has a fun alternate name, it's also called the uvea. And uvea means grape. So your eyeballs are not actually perfectly spherical. They are a kind of smushed sphere with a dome on the front uh, and so that makes them a little bit longer than they are tall and therefore more grape shaped than spherical so hence the name uvea so that's going to include the cornea and the sclera the cornea being the clear dome through which light can pass and the sclera being the white of the eye so here it's just the white fibrous outer portion that you can see when you look at the eyeball. The vascular tunic, which also is sometimes called the uvea, um, 
mostly for its pigmentation. So some sources, uh, depending on how old the resource is that you look at and where it comes from, uh, is going to determine that the fibrous tunic is the uvea, other ones it's the vascular tunic. I'm going st to stick to fibrous and vascular in test questions just to be unambiguous about it, uh, but you may encounter both sets of terminology, so I'm just making you aware of that. So if you're like, wait, I thought the fibrous tunic was the uvea, um, just know that they're both used. It just depends on who you're talking to. So it's one of those cases where uh, because there's no one person or committee that decides anatomical terminology, there's a little bit of wiggle room for how things are referred to sometimes. So the vascular tunic, which is indeed vascular, so lots of blood vessels, is also very pigmented. So I'm going to make that brownish black because the pigment in question is melanin. In addition to being heavily vascular, it's also pigmented. And I'll talk about what those pigments are for uh, in a little bit, but they are the iris, which is the colored part, the choroid, which is very pigmented and contains lots of blood vessels, and the ciliary body. And the ciliary body is going to be uh, basically a structure that is multipartite, but it partially functions to change the shape of the lens, and it partially functions to secrete uh, fluid that maintains your intraocular pressure. So more on that in a little bit. The nervous tunic is the retina, and this is the one that contains your rods and cones, which detect color and light and dark, respectively. And then all of the bipolar neurons and ganglion neurons that make up the rest of the layer that give rise to your optic nerve, which is, of course, the part that exits the eye. So knowing that, let's begin discussing each part. So the cornea is a transparent dome that covers the anterior surface of the eye, and it's transparent so that it can let light in. Because it's transparent, similar to another structure, the lens, it has to be avascular. So to give you an idea of why that would be, let's switch over to blackboard mode for a second. So I'm just going to draw like something. Doesn't matter what. I think I will draw a pig. It's going to be a very rudimentary pig, though, so bear with me. So. I'm making it orange because my pigs are orange. That's why. Deal with it. So here we have our pig. That's a pretty decent pig for a really crude drawing. Not so bad. Now let's give him some spots. Again, why? Because my pigs have spots. That's why. Oh, highlighting doesn't go over the other color. Okay, well, that's fine. Okay, so there's my pig. All right, so if I am looking at the pig through my regular cornea, I'm just going to see a pig. So what is happening is ambient light, uh, let's say from the sun, although it could be from other sources like the light in my barn or whatever, it doesn't really matter where the light's coming from. But the way vision works is that, here I'm going to draw a jazzy little stylized sun. Okay, so the sun emits photons, which are the units of light energy. And photons in the spectrum that we can see there are other ones that we can't, bounce off the pig and come to my eye. So they're coming towards me after having bounced off the pig. 
The cornea is transparent because, of course, the photons that are bouncing off my pig have to go through my eyeball, and they have to eventually get focused onto the back of my eye, which is the sensory part. So photons can travel easily through things that are transparent, like glass or a cornea or a lens, but they can't travel through things that are opaque to the same extent. So the front of my eye needs to be transparent in order to allow those photons through so that I can have them do stuff to my retina that makes a difference. They also need to be bent a little bit so that they can be focused appropriately. I'll talk about that a little later. But regardless, if I have a perfectly transparent cornea with no problems to it, I can see the pig clearly, and that's great. If I have cataracts, I would probably see, even though this is not working because the highlighter thingy is not going to go over the solid drawing, but you get the idea. If I have a cataract, all of the gray areas would, would be blurry and translucent, not transparent, because there's uh, opacity now to my corneas. Oops, not that. This. If I had blood vessels in my corneas, which I don't, but and you don't, but let's just imagine, when I look at my pig, I would see the pig, but I would also see... an overlay of blood vessels if they were to be supplying my cornea. So I'd have this like thing in the way of my perfect clear vision, which would be in the shape of the blood vessels that supplied it. So obviously we can't have, oh, excuse me, we can't have that. Um, we have to not have this overlay because that would obscure our vision. So even though the cornea is made of living cells, which do need oxygen and nutrients just like all the other cells, I can't use blood vessels in the cornea to accomplish that goal. So that leaves me with some other options that I have to consider in order to make this happen. So that's why they are avascular. We can't have that blood vessel overlay. It's not going to work. So I also mentioned when I was looking at my pig, bending the light waves. So a lot of light waves are going to enter. So if it's a far away object, so if it's light bouncing off something that's way far away, like maybe there's like a little house, like half a mile away. Or like one mile even. Let's do half a mile, that's reasonable. If the light is bouncing off and traveling about a half a mile, by the time it gets to my cornea, it's going to be relatively parallel. So we're going to see parallel lines. So the tra trajectory of these photons is going to be parallel. Um, however, that won't do because we need to get them through the pupil and then through the lens. So if this one continued straight, it would not do that. You get the idea. So as my light waves cross through my cornea, which is denser than the air, they bend a little bit because they're encountering a solid medium. So as light moves from a air medium to a solid or liquid medium, the light bends. And this is called refraction. So this is good for us because it, what it means is we can collect all these photons with information contained in them, and then we can make sure they get through the pupil and don't go some random place like land in our retina, or excuse me, our iris. So that's the significance of refraction. So even though it seems crazy, the cornea is at the end of the day just special collagen, and there's fibroblasts between. So in order to ensure that those get oxygen and nutrients, and we'll talk about this when we get to the ciliary part, um, see these little arrows here? I meant to make them blue, but I didn't succeed. Uh, this part of the inner eye produces a liquid, which is a blood filtrate, and that is what is going to carry the oxygen and nutrients to both the cornea and the lens. Um, so if you can't have blood vessels in something, you can at least bathe it in some juice that has the necessary blood components in it to sustain the life of that tissue. So that's what's happening here. The sclera, 
which is the connective tissue layer that's fibrous and not transparent, it's opaque, is also called the white of your eye. So this is also dense connective tissue, but it's just arranged in a different way, so it's not transparent. And this contains fibers and fibroblasts as well, but because it doesn't need to be transparent, those fibers and fibroblasts can just go ahead and go straight to the sclera, no big deal. So this not only provides shape because it's stiff and tough, it also provides rigidity and protection, especially because intraocular pressure helps maintain that rigidity as well as the collagen fibers. Okay, so this is one of my favorite anatomical terms. It just tickles me. It's very funny. And its neighboring term is also humorous. So let's get into it, shall we? I'm going to try and use a not angry color, so not red. So, the sclera is white, and the cornea, let's just write clear, not transparent, how's that? So the little transition where it stops being white and becomes clear, the scleral corneal junction is called the limbus. And at the limbus, there is a little opening in the connective tissue, which gives rise to a vein that carries the fluid away and back towards venous circulation. So this is called the canal of Schlem, who was a guy. So it's not called the canal of Schlem because it, you know, Schlem means some anatomical thing. It's because a guy was like, ah, I found a little tiny hole and there's almost nothing left to call myself after myself because most things have been discovered. So this is my chance. I'm going to call this weird hole the canal of me. Um, but it's also called the scleral venous sinus. So let's write that too. So if you want to not use the weird schlem word, that's fine. Scleral. Even though it's at the limbus, we just had to pick one. So call it scleral. Venous, meaning venous blood. So oxygen poor, waste rich blood. Sinus. Uh, a sinus in the venous circulation is not a full-blown vein because it doesn't have the necessary layers, but it is a space that fluid filters into and gets added to the venous circulation. So the dural sinuses in the cranium are the first ones of those that you learned about, and now here's another one. So that's what we mean when we say sinus in this context. So that's going to go ahead and reabsorb the aqueous humor from the anterior cavity, which is this whole thing. So let's just go ahead and draw this. So from the back of the lens to the cornea is the anterior cavity. And within the anterior cavity, there is the posterior chamber. And the front of the iris is the anterior chamber. So the way it works is that the aqueous humor, which is a blood filtrate, as I mentioned, flows out of uh, some structures here, which we'll discuss later. And what it's doing is carrying oxygen and glucose, and it's going to take away CO2 and wastes. And so that's going to flow from this edge structure, which is part of the ciliary body, bathe the lens, and then travel out through your pupil and circle around in here until it's successfully bathed the inner surface of the cornea, and hopefully diffusion gets most of that uh, oxygen and nutrients through the full thickness. And then it's going to go ahead and drain back into the canal of Schlem, which is going to take all the waste and CO2 away and dump it into the venous circulation. So that's the deal with the canal of Schlem. So if there's something that messes up the reabsorption, but production is still happening, that's going to cause the intraocular pressure 
to go up and up and up over time because we're not absorbing at the same rate as the fluid is being produced. And what that ends up doing is creating intraocular pressure that pushes out on your cornea, causing it to bulge anteriorly, but it also pushes the lens and the vitreous body, which is the goo in the back of your eye, back, and that ultimately is going to impair vision uh, on both ends of visual transduction, and that is called glaucoma. So we want to avoid that. So various things can cause glaucoma. Age can cause it, of course. Uh, vascular malformations of the eye or canal of Schlem can cause it. Blockages, even uh, sclerosis with aging of the veins associated with the canal of Schlem. But regardless, it's not good for vision. The prognosis isn't good, so it needs to be addressed and fixed. So if you go to the eye doctor and you do the test where they have you put your chin on a piece of plastic and then your forehead against another piece of plastic, and then they have you look at a little picture of a house and they blow a poof of air at your eye, what they're doing is seeing if the air poof, as it hits your eye and bounces back, how much of a dent it makes in your eye. So if it makes too big of a dent, that means your intraocular pressure is low and your eyeball and your cornea and lens are not getting nourished enough. And it also means there's something wrong with these structures that produce the aqueous humor. If it bulges outward or it's not very, res like it's too resilient, so the puff of air doesn't move the cornea very much, that is suggestive of high intraocular pressure and glaucoma. Um, so there is a link between high blood pressure that is untreated, atherosclerosis, age. Atherosclerosis is a hardening and deposit of fat that is a plaque-like substance in your arteries. It makes your arteries stiff and not extensible, and it drives up your blood pressure even more. So all of these things tend to increase the pressure in your arterial circulation, and because these little guys in here are pressurized arteries, that's going to cause your uh, aqueous humor production to go up, and the canal of Schlem can't keep up. So that would be an example of where there's no venous blockage, but the production is outpacing the drainage, still causes glaucoma. So there's a link between your visual health and your cardiovascular health, um, and this is true both from the perspective of glaucoma, but also diabetes. So people in the United States especially uh, lose their vision at higher rates than you might think, scary rates, due to either or both because of our lifestyle choices. So just make good choices, you guys. Okay, the vascular tunic consists of the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid. So the part that makes the aqueous humor that I was just talking about is the ciliary body, but that also does other stuff, so we'll talk about each in turn. So the choroid is very vascular, as I mentioned, and that's because, again, if we want light to successfully excite our rods and cones, and then we want that excitation to travel unencumbered, and with no visual overlay of blood vessels uh, back out of our eye via the optic nerve, we have to provide nutrients from behind the excitable layer, not in front of it, so that we don't have like stuff in the way of our photon uh, incoming and transduction via the rods and cones. So in addition to it being vascular, it's also pigmented because photons are high energy particles of both somehow light, or some, somehow, some, excuse me, somehow particles and also waves at the same time. It depends on if you're looking at it or not, which is spooky. Um, if you're, uh, if you've ever taken physics, you are aware of that probably. Um, but if you're not, I'll just give you a brief thing to look up later. So what you want to look up is slit. Diffraction experiment. So slit means a slit in a piece of card or cardboard or paper. 
Turns out if you shine photons through a slit, they tend to diffract or bounce off the slit and bend in a particular pattern. And if you put two slits next to each other, the waves, as they intersect, will either cancel each other out or not. But the way that they behave as they're making their way through the slit depends on if they're being looked at while they do it or not. So that's crazy. And it's just a thing about the universe that you should know. There are mysteries, lots of them, even if you're a scientist and you know lots of things like I do. And one of the greatest things about science is that the further we advance it and push it forward, the more stuff we realize, like we just have no idea. Um, quantum physicists have a better understanding of how the slit dif diffraction experiment works than I do. But neither me nor a quantum physicist is exactly certain, A, why the photons exist as both a particle and a wave, and why it depends on if you're looking at them or not that they choose how to manifest. So, so it, yeah. So science is great because it explains the how, but it doesn't explain the why. So there's definitely room for spirituality and religion, even in the presence of science. They're not mutually exclusive because nothing about science explains the ultimate why. Um, we're just looking at like how stuff works, but like, you know, why a photon has a weird decision power to be like, now I'm a particle, now I'm a photon. It depends on if you're looking at me. Eh, nobody knows. Um, we might never. So that's pretty cool. It should increase your sense of wonder and also make you jazz that you can even detect photons in the first place. But regardless, so I went, I went on a little rabbit trail there, but it was worth it. So yes, it's vascular. Yes, it's nutrient rich. It's also very pigmented. So here's the thing. Uh, photons are also very tiny. So it's like sometimes a particle like so pew, 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 traveling through space. Sometimes it's a wave. Depends on if you're looking at it or not. But regardless, they are high energy. Meaning that they have the potential to pass off that energy to our cells and tissues, which tends to be damaging. So the reason that we put on sunscreen is because ionizing radiation from the sun busts up the covalent bonds in our DNA and breaks it and makes us more likely to have replica replicative errors that would cause cancer. So that's why there's a risk, the link between sun and melanoma, for example. So because they're so small and because there's stuff in front of them, but that stuff in the retina is mostly transparent, there's a real chance that a photon can pass through your eye, through your lens, get focused appropriately, or at least as much as possible, and still manage to accidentally go between the outer segments of the rods and cones and not excite the retinal pigments in there uh, and just kind of careen back into your head because it's so fast and it's so high energy. So we don't want that because we don't want DNA damage. So a great way to prevent that is by using melanin, which is a pigment, a very dark pigment, so you melanin is black. Um, and the thing about pigments is that they are complex, they have lots of ring structures and little charged bits, and so they can absorb radiation and high energy particles easily and dissipate that energy so that it doesn't cause problems. So the reason that you see very dark skin in people from equatorial regions is to prevent that ionizing radiation from harming their skin cells. And the reason you see it in the eyeball is just in case a photon like misses your rod or cone cell and happens to just try to cruise through your eyeball and go do some damage. It's not allowed to because there's a basically a catcher's mitt of pigment behind the retina that's just there for just in case. Okay, the ciliary body. This is a weird thing. So the ciliary body, and the reason it's called body, it's because it's not only one thing, it's a couple things. So there's the ciliaris muscle, 
what you, you might remember from the last video I made a few minutes ago is mostly controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. And then the ciliary processes, so the muscle change shape of lens. And the processes have a pressurized capillary bed in the form of a choroid plexus, not unlike the choroid plexus of your ventricles of your brain, and those produce that aqueous humor that I talked about earlier. So the muscle first. This is cool. So your lens is also living, so it's connective tissue and fibroblast, and it's flexible. So it's suspended, it stays in the middle of your pupil, so the open space that gives rise to space that includes the lens, so we're going to let photons go this way. The ciliary muscle, or ciliaris muscle, via the suspensory ligaments, and these have a fun other name also, so you might see suspensory ligaments, you might also see ciliary zonule, which is a fun word to say. So, these ligaments not only suspend the lens in the middle of the eye, but they also tense or relax to change the shape of the lens. And that's for what we call accommodation, which is switching between looking at a close-up object and looking at a far object. And interestingly, it's not quite what you would expect as far as how the uh, changes work. So when the ciliaris muscle contracts, so the smooth muscle contracts, it doesn't actually pull on the ligaments, it actually pushes up. So the way that this muscle is arranged, it's such that when, here I'm going to use pink and draw a little hump, so when it's contracted, it pushes the ciliaris muscle up closer to the pupil, and that allows the lens to relax and become a rounder shape. And the rounder it is, the more it's going to bend light. So when it goes into that rounded shape, it's going to bend light more to focus it on your fovea, which is closer to the path of light coming off the object. And then if you relax, it's going to put tension on this, which is going to pull the lens into a more pancake shape. And because it's less round, it's going to bend the light less. So that's kind of how it works. So that step again is called accommodation. So anything that's going to change your lens and make it less flexible, uh, notably aging. So time comes for us all people, no one escapes. Um, so loss of flex equals need for reading glasses. So if it's not as flexible, then the ciliaris muscle can push on it all at once, but it's not ever going to recoil fully into a spherical shape, and so it's really hard to focus on close-up objects, which is why as we age and our connective tissues become stiffer, a lot of us end up needing reading glasses. So it's a normal part of aging, it's just that like your connective tissues don't hold up that great over time. Okay, so the ciliary processes, as I mentioned, secrete aqueous humor, which is a blood filtrate, so it's like blood plasma, but it's not blood plasma, and that's going to nourish the cornea, the iris, and the lens. So um, both the avascular structures and also the vascular structure that is your iris. So although the iris looks like it's just a colory thing, it is pigmented in the front. Uh, again, the same reason, so we're going to go ahead and dissipate the energy of incoming photons that strike in the wrong place, so we're going to have them be like, pew! and then their energy kind of fizzles out because they hit a pigment. So this is why light-eyed people have a more light sensitivity than dark-eyed people because there's more uh, melanin in the way of the path of photons in dark-eyed people, so more of those photons get caught, but in light green, blue, or gray-eyed people, 
some of those photons get through and excite the uh, retina anyway, and that creates uh, light sensitivity that Excuse me. is uh, different from that of dark-eyed people. So if you are a blue-eyed person and you're like, man, I really need sunglasses in the sun and my friends don't seem to, that might be why. Just wear your sunglasses. Not a big deal. So the aqueous humor basically just carries oxygen and nutrients and it bathes the lens and the iris and the cornea to help produce a nice oxygenated, nourished set of tissues. And then it picks up wastes and carries them away as well. So I already mentioned the posterior and anterior chambers. Um, so again, flows out from the ciliary processes. It bathes the lens in the posterior chamber, not the posterior cavity, mind you, the posterior chamber. So the space between the posterior cavity and the iris, and then the anterior chamber is the space between the iris and the cornea. Both of those, as you can see from this terminology, are part of the anterior cavity. So we're dividing cavity and chamber. So those are going to circulate, pick up wastes, drop off goodies, and then go back into our canal of Schlem at, again, the limbus, which is this little transition point here. Okay. So I mentioned this in the autonomic nervous system presentation as well, but it bears repeating. So the dilator is going to be basically stimulated by sympathetic activity. And it does so in a pulling motion. So this way, so it's these outer fibers. And these are stimulated by sympathetic activity. So the radial fibers are going to be sympathetic. So when they get contracted, they're going to pull the pupil into a wider position. And this is why, if you have ever seen this stat uh, memified or just randomly, um, that, that kind of like little blurb, like, oh, your pupils can dilate by as much as 20% if you're looking at someone, someone or something you love. That's true. Uh, the experience of being in love or having a crush, like if you have like a really bad crush on someone and your crush like walks into the room where you are and acknowledges you and you're like, ah, saw me. Um, we all know that feeling. So if you were to track your pupillary diameter during that time, the excitement and also anxiety you feel from being in the same room as somebody that you're really interested in, um, that is going to activate some sympathetic nervous system arousal and that in turn is going to cause your pupil to dilate. So that little particular factoid that I see bopping around the internet on Instagram and TikTok and elsewhere, um, that one is actually true. There's a lot of ones that aren't, uh, which deeply irritates me, but it's always nice to see one that's actually borne out by science, and that's one. The constrictor pupillae is this inner ring-like one, and like all sphincter muscles, which are circular and follow the shape of the opening, uh, if they relax, they're going to get wider, and if they contract, they are going to get smaller and block the orifice. So the parasympathetic activity uh, is going to activate the constrictor pupillae, which is going to cause your pupils to constrict. So that's going to limit how much light gets into your eye, which is protective in nature. Um, so if you go and, you know, like, you know that thing where it's the summertime and if you want to get some free air conditioning, you can go see a movie. And then when you get out of the movie, it's been dark the whole time and you have no sense of time and you walk out into the daytime and you're like, oh my God, it's so bright. And also, why is it still light out? Um, that would be an example of a time when your parasympathetic acti activity would be activating your constrictor pupillae. It's trying to be like, oh, photons, no. And it limits how many can get into your eye. So that's kind of the deal there. So I'm just going to add dilate when sympathetic nervous system is, uh, let's say sympathetic nervous system tone is elevated. And then the other one is going to constrict when sympathetic tone is, or parasympathetic tone is, is uh, elevated. So this is an example of what we call, oops, no, 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 go back.
So this is an example of what we call dual innervation, which once again from the last PowerPoint is where both divisions of the autonomic nervous system innervate the same organ. And usually they do so at cross purposes to each other. So the management of that organ is a shared task that is shared by both the sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, divisions of the nervous system to complete homeostasis and their actions oppose each other. So just to kind of reinforce that idea from last PowerPoint. Okay, now we're getting to the cool part. The nervous tunic, which is the retina, has layers. So speaking of the importance of pigments in protecting us from high energy particles, in addition to the choroid, there's also a pigmented epithelium. So again, even more pigment, pigment party all around. But the pigmented epithelium is not only for stray photon catching, it is also there to replenish visual pigments. And I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean by that in just a moment. But um, the reason that your rods and cones are able to generate a receptor potential when a high energy particle strikes them is because when the high energy particle strikes, a special pigment that's in the rod and cone cells called a retinal, it changes its shape. So the energy of a photon striking is enough to make this molecule flip into a different configuration and that flip generates the receptor potential which sets off the chain reaction of transducing a photon striking into an action potential that the brain can understand. So we'll talk about that too, it's really cool. So this pigmented epithelium is both. And then you might remember from chapter 14 when I showed you the embryonic development of the brain and I pointed out the telencephalon and the structures that would eventually become the telencephalon. And I pointed out that there were eye spots already in place. They were kind of bulging off the sides of the developing brain. Uh, the retina comes from those. So similar to the posterior pituitary, there are some developmental features like the retina and the anterior or posterior pituitary that are not going to be included in the cerebral development but instead reach out and end up becoming something else. So that's one example. The other example, you know, there's neural retina in, in the posterior pituitary. So this is just not one in one layer, so we always think of it as being rods and cones. So not just rods and cones. There are also bipolar cells and ganglion cells. That's too many L's. Let's try that again. There we go. Um, so the processing of the neural signal begins even before the signal reaches the occipital cortex. So there is filtering and processing that happens in the retina itself because there's computational power there. So that's really, really cool also. I just love the retina. It's like one of my favorite things. Okay, I showed you guys this in lab just by way of explanation of like some of what's happening with the models, but it bears repeating. The neural retina is histologically really pretty. So it's got these very orderly layers of cells and also you can visually see by the density of nuclei. So I'm gonna get some extra options here. Can I zoom in? No, black screen, white screen, presenter view. Okay, well that sucks. Uh, sometimes I have the option to zoom in, but I guess I don't now. Let's try this. Nope. All right, whatever, doesn't matter. So let's look at the histology image first. I'm just gonna go ahead and label some things just so that you understand what you're looking at. This 
is the choroid. This dark line is the pigmented epithelium. This layer right here are the outer segments of rods and clones. And then these are the rod and cone cell nuclei. So you can see based on the density of the rod and cone cell nuclei that there are a lot of rod and cones, which are the photoreceptors. Then there's this another layer of nuclei, which are bipolar cells, which are also just bipolar neurons. So remember, those are the ones where the cell body is in the middle, there's a dendrite on one side, and there is an axon on the other, and they're often very short. And then we have this even sparser layer of nuclei. In this picture, you can only see three. and that is the layer that contains the nuclei of ganglion cells. So the ganglion cells are the cells that give rise to the axons, which will form the optic nerve and pass out of the eyeball through the blind spot, which is called the optic disc. So now let's compare that to the you can see cartoon image, so we can see rods and cones, and there's lots of them. That's not quite dark enough a color. Let's do this one. So, lots. There are fewer bipolar cells, and you can see that each bipolar cell is innervated by at least two, if not more, rods or cones. So we already have convergence of the signal and processing as the bipolar cells make decisions about, based on their excitation pattern, how they're going to transmit. And then the ganglion cells are even fewer, and you can see that the ganglion cells receive innervation via these other cells, which are called amacrine cells. Uh, but the, gangli the ganglion cells receive innervation from more than one bipolar cell. So in this case, these two, in some cases only one or two depending on the amacrine cell, but even fewer. So once a photon strikes the sweet spot, which is the outer segment, the path of excitation travels the opposite way of what this is, which is the path of a photon, and the signal is convergent. So we start with a receptor potential in each of a lot of cells, and that gets filtered through some bipolar cells, which collect that information and process it, and then that gets filtered through some amacrine cells and some ganglion cells uh, to decide how to excite based on their bipolar cell input. So the signal goes from many cells to fewer cells to only a few cells, and so it is convergent and also represents neural pool processing. So the photoreceptors are the rods and cones, and those outer segments specifically sense light. The bipolar cells process visual impulses. So to give you an example uh, for, that I you know, have frequently used with my uh, sensory physiology class, um, there are aggregates of bipolar cells where the bipolar cells themselves innervate a collection of rods or cones that is roughly circular. And then depending on whether the outer population of those cells or the inner ones are excited, the bipolar cell will decide how it wants to excite or talk to the amacrine cells and the ganglion cells. And that's what gives us intermediate colors because we only have blue, red, and green cones. So any color that you see that's intermediate to blue red and green, so yellow, purple, orange, etc., are going to be the integrated information coming out of many adjacent populations of cones and that information being processed by bipolar cells. So we're not going to go too much into that spatial arrangement. That's more for a hardcore sensory physiology class, but it sure is interesting. And then the ganglion cells further reduce 
that and sort the information to decide things like, okay, so the visual signal is in color and it's coming in. Is it in the fovea, which is the area of highest visual acuity? If yes, we need to amplify that signal because that's the area that's important. That's what they're looking at, whoever this eye is belonging to. If it's not coming from the fovea, then that's peripheral vision and we can maybe detect movement and basic colors, but not much beyond that because we're gonna downplay that information. We really care most about fovea information. So that's an example of some ganglion cell processing that might go on. And then the axons of the ganglion cells carry the visual signal that results back into the brain via the optic nerve. So remember I described transduction earlier as being the act by which a non-neural signal, so some external stimulus that is not either a action potential or anything else, it's like a chemical or a light or something like that, or sound waves. Um, we have to turn those into action potentials in order for the brain to understand that. And the first step to that is doing a receptor potential, which is where transduction comes in. So transduction equals turn the stimulus into a depolarization of some kind. And it's called a receptor potential because they're not quite action potentials. They don't totally match that scheme, but they do result in the exocytosis of neurotransmitter to an innervating neuron. And so um, that's how we turn that signal into an action potential. Most receptor potentials, not all of them, but most of them uh, are gonna be sensory cells releasing glutamate onto the receiving neuron. Uh, glutamate is a neurotransmitter, and if you're thinking that that sounds familiar, you might be thinking of monosodium glutamate, which is a uh, flavor enhancer that's added to food. Um, the reason that monosodium glutamate MSG works is because it resembles a neurotransmitter that we already use, and it happens to be a neurotransmitter that we use in smell and tasting when we're perceiving chemicals in the form of flavors and smells. So if you amplify that, it just makes food taste really good. And if you do that and put some salt on some stuff, damn, it's so good. Um, also, monosodium glutamate, MSG, it does not cause migraines or gastrointestinal distress or any of the above. Monosodium just means it has one sodium attached to it to make it dissociate easily in water and also make it a salt. So it helps to add saltiness to food in addition to adding a flavory goodness. People don't understand names of chemicals, which makes them fearful of them. So they're like, oh, monosodium, I have no idea what that means. That must be a chemical that I can't pronounce and it's therefore scary. It's not, relax. If you look up the chemicals in bananas, your mind will be blown. There's all kinds of stuff you can't pronounce in there and it's a banana. So this whole idea of like, don't put things in food that I can't pronounce and I'm afraid of ingredients I can't pronounce, like that's hogwash. Um, I almost said the other thing, which was, uh, you know, related to horse excrement, you know what I mean. So the deal with monosodium glutamate and the fear mongering around it, especially as it relates to Asian cuisine is that uh, essentially Chinese and Asian food is so super duper good and intentionally and well-crafted um, because they have a longer culinary tradition than Europeans. Uh, it's so good and so much more refined than most European cuisine that restaurants were finding themselves outcompeted by Chinese and Asian restaurants. And they didn't like that. They're like, well, I serve potatoes and steak and I have for 30 years and now I have no customers because they're like, oh, I discovered Kung Pao chicken. So the MSG fear is actually not based in science whatsoever. It's based in racism. It's based in white business owners resenting the success of their Asian neighbors and making crap up to try and get their business back. So uh, that's true. Look it up. You can look up the MSG studies as well on PubMed or Google Scholar. But if somebody is like, oh, I don't want to eat there. It has, they put MSG in their food. Uh, you can calmly and rationally inform them that they have been lied to 
and you should definitely go eat the Chinese food because, oh my gosh, it's so yummy. So yummy. Uh, same with Vietnamese and Korean food. I think Korean food is my all-time favorite. I love kimchi. So, I digress. Most recept receptor potentials are glutamate, and that includes rods and cones. So there is about 6 million cones per retina. And this is great because it gives us trichromatic vision. So color vision, ours is trichromatic, meaning we have blue, red, and green cones. So if you're red, green, colorblind, it means that your cones don't differentiate between red and green, and you see green or maybe greb intermediate shades. Um, and that's sex linked, so it's more likely to be present in males than females for genetics reasons. Uh, but regardless, our, our color vision really is contingent upon bright light. So we have to be in daytime. Uh, you can definitely still see at night, but I think if you find that you're straining to look and you're like, I see an object and I can tell that it's like a truck, for example, at nighttime. Uh, but if I was like, okay, cool, what color is that truck? You'd be like, I don't know. And that's because nighttime vision is mediated by rods, of which there are many more. And rods are going to show you shades of gray in dim light or even darkness. So here's a pro tip, and this is actually recommended by the military as well as me. If you find yourself in a situation where it's not safe to use light, but you need to see and find your, find your way around, uh, don't focus your attention on your central vision. Make yourself more aware of your peripheral vision because that's where all the rods are, and they're much better at dark vision. And that will help you adapt your eyes to the darkness faster and be able to see more detail more quickly, even if you're navigating in extremely dark conditions. So uh, use that lateral vision, folks. It's there for a reason. It's good at sensing edges and also sensing motion. Okay, so here's a close up of the relationship between the pigmented epithelium and the rods and cones. So you, what you'll see is the outer segment, which is this little guy and this little guy, they have their tips embedded in the spaces between the microvilli of the pigmented epithelium. And the reason for that is, of course, again, because the outer segments contain a special pigment which changes its little shape in response to excitation by a photon. And that retinal pigment needs to be replaced or recycled in order for the rods and cones to consistently work due to a stream of incoming photons. So uh, when, speaking of which, this is really cool, when the retina, and this early experimentation on this was done in frog and rabbit retinas, so if you look at a retina in low or no light, when the pigments are fully replenished, it looks purplish because that's what eleven cis retinal looks like. It reflects purplish light. But if you shine a light on it, it switches to trans retinal. And that shape change creates an effect called photo bleaching, which changes the color of the retina that you're looking at from purple to white. And then it takes a while for the retina to go back to being purplish because we're replenishing the original visual pigment via the pigmented epithelium. And I'm really tired and I haven't had a good week, so now there's like a little person in the back of my brain that's screaming at me that it's actually trans retinal, retinal to cis retinal. So just to double check that I'm not like tripping and I want to communicate correct information, regardless, excitation by a photon does change the shape of this molecule, but I don't remember in which direction right now because ugh, I've had, I've been going through it. So I'm going to pause here and just double check myself and then come back and let you know if I was right or if I was wrong. 
Okay, I'm back. Uh, I had a moment of crippling self-doubt, but I'm right. So uh, I guess that message, the message there is believe in yourself. Uh, sometimes your brain plays tricks on you, and in this case I was like, I must be wrong because I'm dumb. But no, no, I was right. I was right. Um, so there is some more detail in there that I haven't mentioned, like the role of rhodopsin and, and retinol, AL versus retinol, OL, but those are beyond the scope of, the scope of this course. So all that you really need to know is that if you want to replenish the pigments, including rhodopsin and 11 cis retinol, and allow it to be photosensitive by turning trans, uh, which is called photobleaching, you have to replenish the supply, and that's what the pigmented layer is all about. Also of note here is that the visual signal and the photon path, the photon path here, let's do a different color yellow, there we go. So photon path is this way. So through the lens, or through the cornea, through the lens, through the vitreous body, and back. Hopefully it strikes here, here, or here, but sometimes it doesn't. And then let's say for the sake of argument that it does strike a cone in this case. So that's jackpot. The signal that's generated, which I'm going to represent here in green, and a smaller dot, please, thank you. So the receptor potential and then the action potential is going to travel back out opposite the photon path. So if on a test I ask you, true or false, the path of the neural signal out of the eye is the same as the path of photons through the retina, you should say false. It is not. They are opposite each other. Okay, so some landmarks of the retina. The optic disc and the fovea centralis, or central fovea. S fovea, excuse me. So the optic disc is actually the blind spot, meaning if we know that the path of a photon into the eye has to go through some layers of cells and hopefully strike a outer segment, and then the neural signal goes back the other way, that means the axons of the ganglion cells, which are closer to the lens than the photoreceptive parts are, those axons have to exit the eyeball, and in order to do that, they have to turn back around and go through the layer of bipolar cells and also go through the layer of rods and cones. And so that necessarily creates an interruption in the presence of rods and cones, which is called the optic disc because it's round, but it's functionally your blind spot because you can't see there. So it's right here. So the blind spot is present, and you can prove that to yourself if you just go on Google and type in blind spot test. You can find all kinds of optical illusion based uh, or optical, you know, trick based uh, blind spot tests that prove to you that you do indeed have a blind spot. You're not imagining it. It's just that your brain is really, really clever and it's good at processing, filtering, and integrating information. So in order to not be constantly distracted by this blind spot, your brain actually extrapolates based on what's around the blind spot and is just like, we're just going to go ahead and pave that over with some related sensory information and make it all seamless and you're not going to see it. And you usually don't. So that's why you can't actively see it. The macula lutea is the exact center of the retina. And so if a photon passes through the center of the lens and the cornea, or cornea and lens, sorry, one after the other, um, it's going to strike the central fovea. So the optic disc is actually offset from the dead back of the central fovea, and it is the fovea that is straight back through the center of the lens and pupil, like so. So the macula, macula lutea means, it's appropriate that I use yellow, yellow spot. And that's because if you shine a light through the eye and you take a picture of the retina, the area around the fovea looks yellower in comparison to the surrounding retina because it is comparatively poor in blood vessels. So the central fovea has lots and lots of cones, and it also contains only cones. So it's a little dent. And if we look at the histology of the fovea centralis, 
what we'll see is that that layer cake arrangement of, uh, of nuclei, where it's many photoreceptor nuclei, not as many bipolar cell nuclei, and even fewer uh, ganglion cell nuclei, that cake is disrupted at the fovea. Basically, it's kind of parted like the biblical Red Sea, so that light entering the eye and going to the fovea has an unencumbered access to the receptive area of those cones. So I'm going to just take a brief pause here and go find you a picture of that uh, to help it make sense, and I'll be right back. It'll take no time at all in your world. It might take me a few minutes. Okay, so we're back. I just went and picked an image. I, I just googled fovea centralis histology, but I came to MedCell. Uh, med.yale.edu, which is part of Yale's medical school, so it's a reliable source, and I sometimes rely on it if Histology Guy doesn't have something that I like, but it has all the stuff that I desire to show you here, so that's good. So the fovea is this divot, and that's what fovea means in general. So the fovea capitis on the head of your femur is the dent in the head. The fovea centralis of the retina is a dent in the retina. And as you can see, what I described is true. So what we have here are the ganglion cell nuclei, the bipolar cell nuclei, and the rod and cone nuclei. And then if you look, they kind of just dissipate here and here to have this nice little clear spot. And there's also a super abundance of cones in this little spot. So we've moved some stuff out of the way. And we've also upped the number of cones significantly. Keeping in mind, this is only a slice. This is really a spot, which means that this thing has a uh, circumference and diameter as well as just looking wide here. But regardless, you can easily see how that's kind of cleared out to clear the path for light. Also, what in the Sam Hill is going on there? Uh, it's definitely not 80 degrees Fahrenheit where I am at all. I don't know where my computer thinks I am, but it is mistaken. Okay, so let's go back to our PowerPoint, shall we? So that explains that. Um, and the reason I chose to show you that histology is because I like the histology of MedSol better than others. So I wanted to make sure I showed you that. All right, so here is the optic disc histology, which again, you can see the axons here. They have to get out somehow and they all converge at the blind spot, which is where there's a notorious or notable, excuse me, interruption in the layer that includes the rod and cone outer segments which detect light. But again, your brain just goes ahead and smooths that over for you, so no big deal. Um, octopi, so they're mollusks, they're very smart, they live in the sea, they have eight legs. Uh, they also have a camera eye. A camera eye is an eye with a adjustable aperture, which is the pupil, and a lens that diffracts light and that focuses it on a uh, photoreceptive surface. So that's that's just the same thing as a camera. The camera does that. So you have a lens and you have a focusing apparatus and that focuses light on your film or your sensor if you're using digital. And those things are adjustable to pull things in and out of focus depending on their distance from you. All of those things are the same. You control a camera by changing the aperture to pick how much light gets in and that influences the attributes of your photo. Um, and then focusing is achieved by, within the lens, uh, moving some pieces of mirrors and glass closer or further away from each other. So that functions as the lens instead of bending. But we call it a camera eye because of how similar this is to the apparatus of a camera. Why are they all the same, even though octopi and cameras and humans are different? Well, if we live in a universe where light works really only one of a couple ways, then that really limits the apparatuses that we can use for successful detection of and discrimination among light-related signals. So those three things converge on each other structurally because we're constrained by how light works. You can only convince photons to make sense in a particular series of diffractions and arrangements, and it turns out camera or camera eye is a really good way to do that. So the reason I brought up octopi is that their retina is a little bit better than ours. 
So instead of having the rods and cones down here, their rods and cones are at the top, so right in the path of light. And what that means is their bipolar cells are next lowest and their ganglion cells are next lowest, so their rods and cones are facing the incoming photons and so they don't have a blind spot, which is obviously the better design choice for a retina if you have one. But we don't have that, so they just did it a little bit better than we did. But they also have brains in their arms, so they did a lot of stuff better than we did. Okay, so here's fovea histology. I don't like this one quite as much as the one I showed you because the fovea is not as prominent and the dissipation of the nuclei is not as impressive, but you get the idea. So let's talk about image formation, and then I think we've, I've gone on long enough and I'll have to do the ear in the next uh, video because this is like an hour, I think, at this point. So how do you make a visual signal make sense? Like how do you get crisp edges enough that you can do things like tell what color something is, tell if it has edges, focus on it, yada yada. So refraction starts with the cornea. Accommodation is what we call it when the lens changes shape to further diffract the light. And the constriction of the pupil is going to control how much light gets in, which also affects the path of light. So the goal in all of this is to make sure that the light that's coming into the eyeball is finagled in a way that it ends up on the fovea and not like all over the place. The problem though is that, especially if an object is close like this one is, the way this stuff works is that the light coming in that's bouncing off of the object is divergent, meaning the photons paths get further and further away the further they are from where they bounced off of. And that's a problem for our eye. We can't deal with that. So our corneal curvature and our lens for close vision uh, is a rounded lens and then the cornea just does whatever it does because the cornea is not capable of uh, making any shape changes on purpose. So if you do all that correctly, the uh, photon paths should be uh, straightened out a little bit and then further curved by the lens and come to a point on the fovea and that gives you nice crisp clear vision. For far objects, where the object is like way past here, uh, the light travels into our eye more or less parallel, which is better, but we still have to do a little bit of bending with the lens. So we have a nice relaxed ciliary muscle and then the pancake shape of the lens, which allows us to focus the focal point on the fovea as well. So, this is just another example or demonstration of the concept I just discussed. So refraction is bending of light rays. So when light crosses from one medium through which travel is easy to another medium through which travel is less easy, even if it's transparent, uh, it bends a little bit. So you can prove this to yourself by filling up a pint glass or a drinking glass with water about halfway and then drop a pencil in it and then look at the glass from the side and you'll notice that the pencil appears broken because above the water, it is bouncing light back at you in one way at one angle and below the water, it's doing it differently because it's through not only glass, but also water, which are a solid and a liquid respectively. This is also why things appear larger underwater than they actually are, making underwater visual size estimation difficult. So, our eyes take advantage of this attribute of light to basically capitalize on it and make sure that we can focus stuff. So most of the work is actually done passively by the cornea just by its shape and then the remainder is done by the lens which finely tunes it. So this is why corneal shape and clarity is important. So clarity we talked about as far as cataracts, so the development of cross-linked proteins in the cornea makes it opaque. This can happen due to scratching and also due to just aging and other problems. Um, but shape is also an issue. So if you have weird conical corneas like I do, so instead of your cornea being nice and domed, it's like, I'm a cone, like so. 
that means that your cornea is what's called aspherical. So because of this weird shape, it doesn't do the refraction that it's supposed to do and it changes your vision and that's called astigmatism. Which for me at least produces nearsightedness. So I can see stuff just fine close up, but if I look at a tree that's far enough away, I'm like, ah, what a nice green blob. It certainly doesn't have any distinct leaves or anything of that nature. It is just a blob. Um, but if you get contact lenses that correct that, uh, or glasses too are possible if I use contacts. Basically what a contact lens does is it's toric, meaning it's thin in the center and thick at the edges. And what that achieves is it just rounds out your cornea, which I drew very poorly, but you get, you get the idea. So again, the goal is always put the light on the fovea. So glasses wise, and ignoring corneal shape, there's also just congenital nearsightedness or farsightedness. So this is just due to the shape of your eyeball. So in myopia, the eyeball is too long. And what happens is that causes the focal point of the fovea to technically, or focal point of the converging light rays based on the lens to actually fall before the fovea centralis. So once they hit this point where they should be converging and hitting the fovea, they don't because the fovea is back here. So instead they begin to diverge again and the divergence makes the image appear blurry. So if you have that, what you need is a diverging lens, which is concave, which effectively corrects your vision and shines the light on the fovea correctly. Hyperopia is when you have short eyeballs. So this is the opposite problem. And this is where close-up things appear blurry, as well as, and it depends on your range and the shortness of your eyeball, obviously. But basically the idea is if we have a convergence point that is behind the fovea, then the light rays are still separated from each other and not coming to a point at the fovea, which mean, again, makes your vision blurry. So we need a convex or converging lens to fix that. So just as you probably didn't know it was, capable, it was possible for your corneas to be a weird shape, it's also possible to have eyeballs that are too short or too long. Imagine that. So the word accommodation in vision is used to describe just changing the shape of the lens to make sure that the light falls on the fovea to the greatest extent possible. And due to the way photons like to work, if you send a photon through not only a transparent solid medium, but also through a curvy transparent solid medium, that tends to bend light even more. So accommodation allows us to switch between seeing near and far objects. So here's a description of what I kind of showed you earlier, and that is that ciliaris contraction uh, counterintuitively actually pushes the ciliaris muscle up and inward and closer to the lens, which makes it relax and allows the lens to adopt a more spherical shape and be more refracty for close vision. And then relaxation increases the tension, pulling it flat, and that diffracts or refracts it less so that we get far vision. Okay, whoa, this is an exciting animation and unnecessary, I don't like it. So I'm gonna call this right now because that video is way long enough and in the next video, I'll talk about the ear and that will complete the material for um, Biology 241. And I actually uh, did the math with the help of a Chrome extension and I was like, how much video have I recorded this term? I'm sure it's a lot, let's find out how much. And the answer so far before recording of this video is at least for lecture, oh no, for lecture and for lab, so total, I have recorded 31 hours and 20 minutes of video. So I've sat here and talked for over a day this term, which is insane. Um, but worth it. It's worth it for you to have access to content 
regardless of whether I'm in front of you or not. And hopefully this will complete my catalog so I can have less work to do in the future. But wowee, that's a lot. I shudder to think how much I've recorded over all time. But I have to add some more because we got to get to the end. So I will see you in the next video about the ear. Adios.